Welcome to the Safety Share, a webinar series brought to you by CIM Magazine and the CIM Health and Safety Society. I am your organizer, Michelle Beacom, Managing Editor of CIM Magazine. Today's presentation, sponsored by Pan American Silver, is Serious Injury and Fatality Prevention for Engineers. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you joined, if you joined by phone or by computer, please make sure that you've selected the computer audio button. If you joined by phone, please make sure you've selected the phone button. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type them into the question box on your GoToWebinar control panel. The questions will be held until the end. Uh, note that we will have some poll questions during the presentation, so pay attention. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We are excited to be partnering with the Health and Safety Society to be able to bring this series to you. I am very happy to have Nelson Bodnerchuk with us to both host and to make this series happen. Nelson is treasurer for CIM's Health and Safety Society and vice president for health and safety at Torx Gold Resources. Welcome, Nelson. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, and thanks for everybody for joining us today. Uh, I know this week has been a pretty busy week overall with a few different uh, CIM events, uh, both lunches and conferences, as, long, uh, as well as uh, a few online uh, webinars as well. Um, I'd also like to thank Upfront uh, Pan American Silver for continuing to sponsor this, uh, this effort on uh, discussions around serious injury and fatality and, and talking about safety and bringing it to the forefront for our industry. Um, so today, this episode of the Safety Share, we'll continue that discussion on preventing serious injuries and fatalities, or SIF, or SIF, as some call it, uh, in, across our industry. Uh, but we'll be focusing on what engineers and their managers can do to design out potentially fatal conditions in our mines, plants, and even systems. So during uh, all aspects of the ETCM cycle as well, so right through it in, into the end of uh, the management, the design change aspects of it or sometimes referred to as engineering modifications. Uh, so I'm happy to introduce our guest speakers today, starting with Brian Menard, who is a former mining executive with Anglo-American and former group COO of Fair Expo. With 42 years experience uh, in the mining industry uh, and a broad career covering exploration, technical services, mining and mineral processing, Brian recently retired from full-time work after leading Anglo's Global Elimination of Fatalities Task Force from 2018 to 2020. He's also led multiple mine operations where sustainable benefits and safety, including zero fatalities, were delivered in Canada and globally. Um, Brian is a geological engineer, Canadian citizen, and currently I, he's based in Italy, but I think today he's joining us from France, so living the good life. Um, also joining us today is John Treen, Vice President of Automate Mining. John has over 30 years experience in both operations at Valley and with large consulting firms. He's currently the president of Automate Mining, as I mentioned, where he works as independent consultant transferring mining for, for a sustainable future. Uh, and John's philosophy of building relationships through care for clients and team members has led to great success in health and safety performance. He's an advocate for safety and incident prevention through design and dedicated his career to improving mine operations all over the world. So without further ado, I guess we'll turn it over uh, to you gentlemen for the first question today. We're gonna be sharing a few slides. Um, and I guess on our last episode of the Safety Share, we learned a little bit about serious injury and fatality and what the SIF study group has been working on. Um, but engineers and technical leaders have been working for decades to prevent serious injury and fatalities as part of their roles in designing inherently safe systems to begin with. Um, and really in, in the hopes of preventing serious injuries and fatal, uh, fatal incidents uh, as part of you know, the overall work that they do, um, both in infrastructure, mine facilities, and in the systems that we implement on site or the mobile equipment that we have on our sites. So in your experience, gentlemen, what do you believe are the essentials for designing safe systems infrastructure and or even mobile equipment and i guess on, on this one i'll start with brian turn it over to you I think, yeah thanks nelson i think getting a clear understanding of sources of energy and all the, the variety that there is and those are changing over time as technology and and people are changing and and so i i like these sort of six things 
are we are we really giving uh, engineers um, clear guidelines and what's what's expected from their design at the end? Um, making sure the business case is robust because we all have bosses and at the end of the day there has to be uh, a solution that meets everybody's expectations. Engaging with design engineers, I recently met with with a couple at a site and they had never met the GM at site. They had never met anybody from the business unit. They'd never been an executive from corporate office. And so all I did was ask them about fatal hazards that, that they see as mining engineers in the open pit. And uh, when they were done talking about them, I asked them if their spouse, if they'd ever bring their spouse into the open pit and they both said, no, not a chance, too dangerous. So we went on to talk about the things that they put into their designs to make it safe for the operators and, and maintenance personnel in the, in the pit. And by the time they were done explaining what they do, I asked them the same question again. Would you take your spouse into the open pit? And their answer had flipped. They said, yeah, absolutely. And it was just that nobody had taken the time to listen to them about what their day is like, what are the things that they come up against? And more importantly, they actually know more than they think they know about the hazards that exist. And so in their designs, they, uh, they take that into account. And that comes partly from that detailed design review as well. And then of course, now you've got to hand it over the fence to ops or maintenance or the construction team to, to get going. And, and I think operational readiness is a fairly new um, expectation that, that senior management uh, has. And then lastly, We've got the design, but have we actually constructed it as that design engineer had in mind? So to me, those are the big ones. John, would you like to jump in there? Yeah, I'll just I'll add a few more. And I think, you know, Brian's slide covered it very well around the aspects. For, for me, I think one of the big things in the industry is the training of the engineers on, on just what Brian had showed on the screen and how to properly implement that. And you know, I think back to my career where I was about, you know, five or six years in engineering and the rest in operations. And the majority of the training you do, and, and rightfully so, is around how to make sure you're safe at the face, prevention and identifying risks at the face. And, and as an engineer, the same training happens to you because you're, you know, you're in the workplace, whether it's open pit or, or underground. But I think back to how many training sessions I had as, you know, as an engineer, how do I design out risk? What do I need to do to, to prevent risk in the designs I give to people? And, and that training is, I think, the huge opportunity to help us in the industry, covering all the aspects, Brian says. And it could be formal training or it could be mentoring. I mean, talking with other engineers, talking with operators and seeing what's going on. So I think, you know, to Brian's points, he covered it greatly. The next step is how do you get the engineers understanding and engaged in, in those items and, and truly, truly developing that whole system that he, that he ran through? Maybe just to grab a bit on John's training concept, I think. Sometimes the word training scares bosses off and education can be less onerous in certain applications. So for example, lightning and the, and the dangers of lightning can be done in a 15 minute education session. It doesn't have to be a week long training program. So I think training and education sometimes get overlapped, but they both have, have a, a very valuable role to play. And you're right, Brian. I mean, one of the things in previous uh, companies that they talked about, you know, the three E's of development or training, and it's exposure, experience, and education. Right? The education is the small part of it. It's actually exposure in the field, where your designs are being used, or where they may be used in the future. Talking to the people that use them, the people that build them, the people that maintain them. You know, what what works well here? What what do we want to make sure are in the new designs, or what can be improved on? And it's it's that it's that interaction, you know, through the steps you talked about that can really help improve and move us towards a safer fatality, you know, reducing fatalities and SIFs in the industry. Yeah, I was about to say, I hear a lot of um, talk about not overtraining people. And I think when you really look at how much time people actually spend either in a classroom or in the field training, it's, uh, I wouldn't say it's not enough, but the quality of that training could be improved. And there's lots of opportunities out there to, to find different ways to intervene from, a, from an adult learning perspective, right? Um, I did work at one company where we where we focused on it was workplace violence prevention, and the the 
stat or the regulation in Ontario says you have to have that. You have to have a course once every three years. And somebody read that as, as a three hour course and say so developed a three hour course on, you know, something that's really a, it's, it's a very serious discussion. And it's probably about a half an hour, 40 minutes when you really bad it up. But it became this every three years, three hour course that people were dreading because they were going into a very morbid detail on on some pretty pretty heavy topics so um it's all about for me it's all about the quality and what are who's checking the you know is the training uh, achieving the purpose that it was it was put in place to meet that's great so the next the next question i have for you gentlemen is you know we talk a lot about um massive improvements in our industry and, and anyone that looks at you know either a, a SAF sinking job or a mine build or even a construction project we have made improvements from a fatal and and severe uh, or serious injury perspective over the last couple of decades and i find that a lot of companies have like these two lagging metrics right the the ltif and the trif and then the fatality metrics and those as soon as you see ltif and trif skip down below one um, most companies are like, this is great. And then every so often you have a fatality or two, right? A really unfortunate incident that occurs. Um, and so, you know, we've introduced equipment in the field over the years that have shifted that profile down. Uh, one of the, one of the big pieces of equipment that comes to mind is the McLean Bolter, right? If you look at mining in the seventies, underground mining in the seventies and eighties, there was, there was, you know, the fatality lit rate was up here and then they introduced the Bolter and, the fatality drop the fatality rate dropped in Ontario quite a bit and so there's a lot of things I think that uh, our industry has done over the years to help reduce those those fatalities across the industry um, but what, one thing I've learned at least in in the reading and the experiences I've had in studying this is the majority of these fatal or disabling injuries are they occur usually because a known control was missed or not verified in place before the job started or it changed while the job was going on and and it went unnoticed or un, unaccounted for. So the question for you two gentlemen is why do you think this happens? And how can we improve our designs and implementation of those controls in the field? And this time we'll start with John. Yeah, thanks, uh, Nelson. You know, I'll go back, uh, you know, just to talk, if, if you haven't seen some of the other safety shares, I'll go back to the one on safety at the face. And, you know, Amanda and Sandor Basa really, they had a statement that was really good you know, one of the most important things are the decisions made at the face and that helps to prevent you know fatalities and risks um, but one of the things around that is the hierarchy of controls that i'm a, a big believer in right and if you look at it and i like the the pyramid upside down because it shows effectiveness where ppe and admin procedures are the least effective and the next four that become more effective separate redesign substitute eliminate you know they're highly engineering um processes that can go in there to design out the hazard. Now, the other thing with that is if you look at the arrows, obviously from the bottom to the top, you're getting more effective. But on the right uh, right arrow, the human reliance becomes less as you go up. And so, like you said, around the McLean Bolter, you've now, you know, you've separated the individual from the open ground. So that's made less of a, an impact if the wrong decisions made. And so for me, I think one of the biggest things that can be done is focusing on this and figuring out what can we do to eliminate, substitute, redesign, or separate through. And so, you know, that's one of the big things, you know, how do we make that happen is the next question, right? Because it's not that easy. Um, and what prevents it from happening so that we don't have the best designs eliminating out or substituting all the hazards out. And for me, it's very similar to, you know, if you think again back to the, to the miner at the face, you know, they talk about what causes some of the, the errors in judgment or, or decision making and it's training, it's time, it's cost, it's the, you know, the, the objective to get the job done in the mind. So, so shortcuts are taken um, and not, not literally, a, may not be a shortcut, it might just be another way to do things more time efficient. And that really isn't different in the engineering world if you think about it. You know, when the engineers are trying to put out their designs, Time is still an issue. And, and even if, you know, luckily you've given lots of time to work on the design and they do that, the issue about getting a proper review, either on constructability or from operations or for maintenance, it takes some time to get those individuals or, or they might not even have the ability, you know, to give the time to give the responses to it. And so time in that aspect isn't around just the engineer's time to get the job done or how much notice he had, it's, it's getting feedback. 
And the worst thing that can happen is gets no feedback or even worse feedback too late. So he doesn't get implemented into the designs because of a, of a time crunch, right? And so now you've called on operations or you've called on maintenance to say, okay, what can we do differently in the design? They give feedback, but you just don't have enough time to do it. So you put it out the way it was. And so one, the design isn't improved and didn't reduce the risk. But two, you've also now sort of prevented those individuals in the future of giving input because they're wondering what the value of it is. So time still is a big aspect in the time crunch to make sure things get done. Um, I talked about training already too. And then the last thing for me is really just on cost. And when I say cost, it's not around, it costs too much to put the design in. It's the cost to prepare things and do things ahead of time to get it right. You know, if you've ever looked at a, a curve that shows project impact and cost, the earlier on in the project you do something to change it, the lower the cost is, the closer you are to construction or operations and you want to make a change, the higher cost is. So it's, it's actually the front end dedicating the, the time and the cost and the resources to put the right design aspects in there. And, you know, the advice I'd given this, this isn't from a consultant saying, you know, don't go with the, the lowest bidder. It's saying whatever it is, whether it's external consultants or internal engineers, you know, make sure you realize that that value they provide grows exponentially if the, if the solution is right. right. If you're paying or if you're training your engineers or you get them to go out and see something at another operation that's best in class, the amount of, t of money it costs you to do that or your operation to do that is, is very small and proportionate to the benefit it brings when that design is implemented. And so those are the, you know, the three big things that I would say are, are some of the things that you know, could help us with getting these designs better in and, and redesigning these decision making in the, in the field out. Um, and the last one I would just get is knowledge sharing. Right? All the stuff we talked about, how do you share this knowledge? How do you pass it on from engineers to engineers, from operators to engineers? Uh, I think when you and Brian and I were, were talking earlier, preparing for this, it was you, I think, mentioned when you got your first job in the engineering office, you were surrounded by people that had 25, 26 years experience in the engineering office. And, and I was the same way. Um, you know, Brian likely was the same way too. It's not that way now. And, you know, to get that experience, to get that knowledge share, it's critical that we pass that on to one another um, so that we can take, you know, what we've learned and why we change things that people don't fully understand, but they were put in for a reason. How we make sure we don't lose those advantages. And then how do we look at the risks that are still there, put things in, design those out, and make sure that gets carried on as, as well, too. So I think those are the big, the big aspects for me. I like what we you said there about front loading that, uh, John. Brian, when, could you give us uh, your answer on that? And I, I want to cue you up for the, uh, the, fatal, the elimination of fatalities task force there. There must have been some great learning that you had there through leadership that you had. Yeah, I think a couple of things. One, when the regulator says you have to put in a system to address a hazard that um, we found at another operation, sometimes we don't get into a robust debate over why they want that and the same thing can happen from a top-down request in terms of you need to you guys at site need to do this and so we need more conversation around around the why i think in your last webinar it was clear that we had plateaued on the number of fatalities in the industry and there was starting to be a bit of creep with which means we have to put more energy into the problem and it gets hard once you get down to really low numbers um, I said to a mine rescue captain one day at site, why do people take shortcuts? And he said, well, that's a hard, hard question to answer. And he paused for five seconds and then he said, I guess it's because the opportunity not to doesn't exist. And so when I met a mechanic on a four kilometer long conveyor, I asked him about locking and tagging. He said, Brian, I'm not walking up the incline four kilometers to lock and tag because that's what I'm supposed to do. Instead, I'll just pull the trip cord, I'll change the idler, and then I'll reset the trip cord. And so that's not just an engineering design issue, that's a collaboration between a whole bunch of groups to really sit down and talk about, and including the regulator, what are the options we have to lock and tag in a, in a situation like that so that the design engineer can then get to work and come up with a couple of, of alternatives. Um, commissioning of a system. So 
collision avoidance between machine and machine is is working pretty good and it and it's improving over time but this man machine interface technology all the ones everyone that i've been involved with gives so many false positives to the either the pedestrian or the operator of the equipment that eventually they just stop listening to to the automated voice telling them that there's an alert and in fact a lot of operators i've met they don't even know that that, that alert is coming out anymore i was the one that was hearing hearing the alert so i think instead of just buying something off the shelf because somebody else said it was a really good thing we we really do need to make sure that it's commissioned properly and that the crews understand why we want that yeah and that well, collaboration piece is so key right john you, you sound like you want to say something there well i just think brian clued me into another one and, and you know i was fortunate enough to work with brian for a few years at, at valet and inco and you know that curiosity the questions he says he asks people and and what comes out of it is key right a lot of times you can do you know inspections in the field and see what's going on but the curiosity asking the open-ended questions understanding how things work not when you're there looking at this example but when certain situations come up are so key and i think that's another thing with training the engineers not around you know just around observing what's going on in the field but having that curiosity mindset and asking those open-ended questions is is key yeah and at, you know I, i'm reminded of from brian's uh response there of a time when we were designing a cleaning system and you had to have an operator clean the, the floor of the plant with process water and then rinse it with fresh water and i was saying like why why are we doing that and they're like well you want to capture all the all the slurry back into the sump and send it back into the process and then you want to clean the floor i was like there's no operator that's going to go and clean it with the fresh water that'll never happen right? um and, and they're like well why not and it's because well would you do it like it's just so you got to find ways to engineer those solutions whether whatever they may be in every situation to eliminate steps right especially ones that are clearly unnecessary in the field or or that will be seen as extra work um that's that's great gents we're going to jump into we're going to turn this over now instead of listening to three of us to talk uh, we're going to turn it over to you the audience and ask a quick poll question uh, and specifically, it's multiple choice. There's no um, all of the above answers. Uh, but how can engineers improve designs and of facilities to prevent fatal or disabling on injuries? Your side of the bed, they can't see you. The employees and contractors. Can everybody see that on the screen? Yeah, it's up, uh, Nelson. looking for my poll window here i like the fact and many of the firms are you know our organizers go with us where employees and contractors are seen as one right and i think that's one of the shifts we're making in in organizations now and in the industry is that it's it's an individual underground it's not well this was the employer this was the contractor and i think just the way this is phrased helps to make sure make people understand that it, it is everybody that at, that's at the site that everybody needs to look look and take accountability in yeah there's human beings on site performing work got to be yeah. treated i know there's different admin controls around how they get paid and how they get supplied their equipment and the you know some of the work processes they have but when it comes to you know the business side work process but when it gets into the field the operation side you have to yeah really treat them the same okay so michelle how are we looking on this poll here looks like we've got 30 provide better communication channels with on-site personnel uh, followed closely by implement more advanced technology and automation. That technology and automation is a good piece, Brian. You mentioned uh, saying about the systems that you saw create false positives. I think there's a lot of opportunity with some of the AI that's coming out now and camera tech um, to recognize people versus uh, you know a machine part moving. Um, but I think we're still a few years away from that. Some of the costs on those systems are very high still, right? Because they're still in the R&D phase, but those will come down. Jens, do you have anything to I add could, on these poll, poll results? Yeah, yeah, the bottom one, so the communication. We had, we had a site ask us um, about changing large mobile equipment tires. They thought that their equipment was a bit dodgy and, and unsafe. Is there anything we had seen in the 40 sites we'd been to that they could use that would make it a lot safer for the employees? Their own operation a few kilometers down the road was already using something much better so how, 
how is it that senior management can't get that communication sorted out so that two minds a few kilometers apart aren't sharing very vital information on quite a dangerous task? I think org design sometimes has some some to do with that, depending on accountabilities and who's focused on what. But uh, that's in the larger companies with multiple sites, that's usually a big deal, right? Um, so I'm going to move on to the next question here. Just checking the time. Yeah, we're still good. Uh, so what areas of a project, based on that poll question and based on what we talked about, talked about so far, you know, gents, what area? Of, I'll start with Brian on this one. What what areas of a project or steps should engineers focus on? To address those those fatal those causes of those fatal incidents, like whether it's a near miss or an actual fatality or you know dis disabling injury, what what steps of a project on the front end should engineers look at to help reduce those opportunities? I think one of the tricky ones with the fatality is that um, in a lot of jurisdictions, the lawyers get involved um, here pretty early. And so there's nervousness about how much information can be shared or communicated with sites or neighbors. And so what happens then is that the design engineers start working on immediate causes because it's all it's all we have coming out of the out of the literature, the media, whatever. And so we really don't start designing. And I don't I know some people don't like the word root cause, but there are key systemic causes that sometimes don't come out in the in their early analysis of, of the investigation. Nervousness around future litigation and, and things like that. So in in some ways we're tying the engineer's hand, one hand, you know, behind their back. Um, so I think somehow we, we've got to work out a way that we can share systemic failures so that they can be addressed once and for all. Um, yep. I'm going to change over to John here. Response to that? Yeah, and I think I'll take you know approach a different angle from Brian, where you know not after a fatality, but as you're in a project, what can you put in to prevent fatalities? And and the one thing for me that I think is highly effective is a formalized HAZOP or whatever other risk you know risk procedure that the company phrases it as. And you know formal HAZOPs are good, but formal ha HAZOPs are probably done on you know, 20% of the designs, if, if that, right? And, and so for me, it's how do you get that mentality of what occurs in a HAZOP into the engineer so that he thinks about it in that way or she thinks about it in that way and she talks to others in the field that are maintainers, constructors, operators and gets their perspective. So without a formal HAZOP or hazard review, they can have the discussion when they're doing their own work to say, okay, yeah, here's what we need to do. Here's some hazards I identified and how we can mitigate it or Here's some hazards that I didn't identify, but when I talked to this person, they identified it, and how do we design it out? And so I, for me, I think that's the biggest thing is that has op mentality in a formal structure, yes, but how do you get that to be the basis of every time you do a design, every time you think about it, walking it through some type of, of process to look at the hazards, especially the critical risks or you know, items that create significant incidents and fatalities. It, it, it's such an easy, place to focus on is those first critical risks or whatever the organization call them. Let's make sure we're looking at those at least and have we addressed any hazards that are there, um, that it, that those hazards are in there, how can we design them out? I think the other thing with risk management is that sometimes the design engineer and operations and maintenance aren't on the same page, right? And so you get one seeing probability very high and consequence low and the other group seeing probability very low and the consequence very high. And so I've been called into lots of situations to be the arbitrator in those discussions. And, and just by engaging with both groups in the room at the same time, you can get much better alignment on probability and consequence. And once you have that alignment, then the design engineer can get back to the drawing board. And I think just to add to that, Brian, like a lot of times the engineer is so busy taking notes or figuring out what to change in the design, they missed the why or what the risk was, you know, the true risk in that discussion and, and having the ability, one, to yes, to address what's concerned, but as an engineer, listen to the whys, listen to what the concerns are so that in different designs, different situations, that why is still in your mind and you, and you use that thinking to design out a hazard somewhere else. That's, that's another thing that I think would be very valuable in, in assisting this. It's interesting. Um, 
you know, I've, I've gone through a few larger project builds over the last uh, 10 to 15 years uh, of my career here in mining. And there's always like, there's not enough time to do some of the things that really matter, it seems, right? And they, it gets mixed in. And so I think there's a there's a tool out there that I'd recommend for for any engineer looking to, to prioritize their time um, based on, you know, is it urgent and important, right? And if it's both, do that first. And if it's urgent but not important, find a way to drop that, right, from a design perspective. Like when you're designing a project, there's things where you have to just, it's almost a daily exercise of reassessing on what's the most important thing that you have to focus on. Um, and and usually there's a good there's a good uh, pull between cost, schedule, and and uh, I guess scope, right, are the three that you you look at when you're talking bigger projects. But so excellent answers, gentlemen. We're chugging along here. I will ask the next question and then we'll jump into another poll after your responses. But you know, what are the, some of the things that the engineers that you folks have worked with or led on your teams? Um, you know, what are some of the things that was an innovation or an improvement from past practices that you've implemented with your teams or that you've seen implemented with the engineers that you work with to address this, uh, this issue of, you know, engineering out fatalities in a, in a project or a, uh, you know, modification, uh, job or whatever, what have you. Maybe I'll go first, Nelson. Yeah. And I think. I think for me, one of the things is not design specific, but maybe if you call up slide 12, uh, um, Michelle, if you could do that. One of the things for me is the move from 2D drawings to 3D designs, and then the ability to use those 3D designs um, as a as a virtual or augmented reality exercise. Um, and so, slide's not up there, but it talks about detailed design reviews, and that's one of the things for me that you know, that I really, when I first got to uh, the consulting firm I was at, was really happy with the 3D designs and the ability to see what that looks like in 3D space. And now, you know, with virtual and augmented reality, you know, you know, you could take this at a design stage, put on a halo lens or whatever virtual tool you want to use and walk through there and you would see these items and would get identified right away. Because if it's a 2D drawing, you know, you have a very hard time understanding how it operates or, you know, what the maintenance of it's going to look like, let, let alone constructing it. But if you have it in 3D space, getting in there with maintainers, operators, constructors, engineers walking it through and being able to show things is so much of a value. And, and you know, we, we talk about training and exposure. To me, there's nothing better to train an engineer if, if he was with a maintenance person here and they, they're looking around and say, oh, look, Look up here in this design in this 3D virtual world where you see that over there, this is going to cause a hazard. We need to change that. You see this? We need to change that. And so I think for me, you know, it's not any one change. It's that capability that is really starting, you know, the window to really change the way we see things and design things. And, and I'll just add on to build things because the one other aspect that I saw that was tremendous and it happened, you know, we did this for, for a project in Indonesia. And obviously language was a bit of an issue. So, you know, getting to show an animation of how a work procedure is done piece by piece, seeing how everything goes through was so effective. But I, I get back to even in the same culture, in the same language in Canada, if five people read a procedure, it's very unlikely that even two of them see it in their minds the exact same way. And now you've created risk. And so you take that animation of a work procedure and you show people and, and they're all on the same page and they can ask questions and you you know a, a quick 20 minute animation that gets used as a two minute lineup to show it gets everybody on the same page and in the right and the right bend for where the future goes so i i actually think that this virtual reality animation is going to change not just designs but construction lineups reviews i think it's going to be really an opportunity for the future and and create an opportunity to design out, not truly design, but implementation side of that design, design out the risks. 100%, Brian? I think the, the biggest one for me, really since starting in 79 is, there used to be at least one fatality with a fall of ground every year. 
at, at some site in Canada. Um, and then some, some of the bigger sites globally, they would have 15 fall of ground fatalities per year. And I think the ground control engineers have really gotten together as a fraternity and started to come up and, and share things much better than they've done in the past. I think that the seismicity theory and software and hardware has really made a big difference in, in deep operations. Um, and, and then there's a leadership aspect around that particular topic. And so one of the sites that we had in, in our organization had more than one fall of ground fatality every year. And so the executive sat with, with site and said, what do we need to do so that we go 12 months without any? And just that leadership conversation combined with ground control engineers getting the support they needed meant that that site with more than 10,000 people underground went 12 months without a fall of ground fatality. And so you're mixing technology with, with um, practitioners and with leadership support. And that's an example of, to me where things have really changed for the better. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, we continue to improve and just like everything with continuous improvement, you realize once you get there to your destination, there's another destination ahead of you, right? Um, I, I wanna go back briefly uh, to the point you made, Brian, about the tech on uh, the ground control side and even John with the, um, the augmented reality, like a lot of these things, I know a lot of folks I talk with, especially when I'm at like PDAC or CIM, um, are excited about this tech. But then you look at the companies that are implementing them, um, and how I guess the how fast they implement them, right? Um, and a lot of these costs have come down over the last year for a lot of this. A lot of this, what seemed pie in the sky sci-fi a few years ago, is now you know a five thousand dollar rig, and you've got an augmented reality headset. Um, instead of you know the fifty thousand plus the licensing fee you used to be paying, um, so I think that companies, especially the folks in tech services, they're usually the ones that hold the pen on on the technology roadmap because it's so integral to their job. Uh, I think that's key that folks like that are looking at these things and, and understanding what's what's going on, and they also have maintenance and and leadership involved too, right? Um, Thanks for those those answers, gents. We're getting almost to the end of this. So we're gonna jump back to poll number two. And this is for you, the audience. Uh, looks like we got about 117 people online right now, which is great. Um, what areas of a project or operation should leaders focus on to address the cause of fatal incidents? I'll let that sit for a moment while people answer. Nelson, just as people are answering, you know, your point around the technology for virtual augmented reality gone from 50,000 down to 5,000. If you think back to the, you know, the slide we showed with the, the overhead supports and how to change that, $50,000 would be a small cost compared to the cost of putting that in, the risk associated with it, going back to redesign it and change it afterwards. And, you know, we, we always say, yeah, it should have been done right the first time. But if you spend $50,000 to design not just that you know not just that design but a bunch of them with that same fifty thousand dollars the impact and the benefit can be you know extremely large if you use it properly to to actually change the design before they get constructed yeah okay how are we looking on that poll michelle it's 71 percent voted i think i'll close it now yeah close enough to 80. And how are we looking for results here? Yeah, resounding 46% remote open reporting of safety concerns. That's, you know, the, one of the biggest things we talk about in my day job is uh, open open reporting culture, right? Report everything, even if you're unsure, even if you think it's a mistake, even if safety decides, no, that wasn't this, that was a this or that, if they reclassify it when they're going through their quality check, right? That's a, that's a big one. The second one, 28% invest in better safety equipment and technology, what we were just chatting about. So any responses there, gents, to what we see on the screen here? Maybe Before number that. two, maybe number two, because it's always the hot one. And I'll be a bit provocative here. I was lucky between 2018 and 2020 to talk to more than 8,000 production and maintenance workers. And there's um, 
there's a lot of energy put into the whole safety arena. So cuts and bruises, broken bones, a disabling injury and loss of life. And so I said to them, you know, why don't you report some of these things? And they said, well, A, in, in certain bonus conversations, mm. if you report one and it takes your, your bonus down, then, then you're, you're ostracized for the rest of the year. And the other one is that it's just easier to report the minor ones because then people think we've got open reporting and we can avoid having to report the ones that relate to the loss of life. So there, it's really a bimodal distribution. Lots of the little ones are getting reported, but the big ones are getting hidden. Yeah, having having everything reported isn't necessarily a good thing if the big things aren't, the more important ones aren't, or things are getting scrubbed under the rug, right? So what I'm hearing there is that really, you know, leadership has to take a look at how are we, how are we awarding for safety and what what what's driving the the behavior we want, what's driving the behavior we don't want, right? John, anything to add there before I jump into the last question? I mean, I, the only other point I would add is we talked about opening, you know, openly reporting safety concerns, but I get back to Brian's point he made about the ground conditions and, you know, in the industry because it is a high risk industry. When we do have incidents, we communicate the the bad side of that quite a bit. And so falls of grounds, how often they occur, you know, you can you can pick that up quickly. Brian's point about a mine that turned it around and went for that and had none, that's not as easy to find. And so how do you actually communicate and look at the successes we've had in designing out um, you know, SIPs and how do we communicate, pass that along and share that also in the industry, I think is critically important and much more difficult to do but could add a huge amount of value. So we're, we're honing right in on there and, and it's great because it's a great segue to the last question I have for you gents. You know, what gets measured, it gets done is the old adage, right? And so how should engineers measure their performance or engineering departments measure their performance on preventing fatalities proactively? You know, we've got these lagging indicators, you know, those aside, you know, where are the leading indicators that should be focused on design stage or rest of EPCM project cycle? And Brian, I'll start with you on this, or sorry, John, I'll start with you on this one because you're just chatting about it. Yeah, no problem. I mean, I think I would add just a couple points on, on the leading indicators that should be measured, right? And and for me, it's it gets around to the reviews. So one is a good design, but the reviews are the key. So measuring how much time how many comments came back on reviews what it was like from the people that reviewed it maintenance operations making sure to have that cross section and, and not just a sign off right but true comments are coming down and how they're getting addressed and i think the other ones would be you know proactive design changes to improve safety tracking that somehow as a positive would do two things one it would help people share what the positive change was made so they might be able to use it in other designs or in other applications and then two, it would actually create a culture of people looking for, okay, what can I do to change my design to actually design out more risk that's in there? So those would be just two additional leading metrics that I think would be valuable in an, in an engineering world. Right. Um, <laughs> again, it might be a bit provocative here, but I think there has to be proof of a conversation with a neighbor. So if I'm going to do a design for lock and tag or for overhang, you know, over hanging crane or whatever it might be. And I can't prove that I've done literature review or or talk to a competitor down the road or somebody in a related industry, then I then I I don't think my design should be taken uh, as it is. Um, I think we need to start capturing far misses, right? So everybody's talking about near misses. What about those ones where there is no evidence left of a really bad situation? So if trammers are supposed to blow a whistle to, to move the train forward or backward, after, the, after the, the incident, there's no evidence of whether that whistle was, was blown or not, light signal being the same. And so what are the farm, what are the farm misses? And that only way we're going to find out about the farm is, is is to get into really engaging conversations with the crews. And 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 then the, the last one is 
for me, there has to be evidence of proof that there's an alignment between operations, maintenance, and the design engineer on probability and consequence, because otherwise the design is going to be a shot in the dark. Um, and, and then the blame game starts later when it doesn't work as expected. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, the pharmacist that I've been toying with that concept uh, for probably the last two years on how to have a, a discussion with folks that say we've had some, but it's just such a, it's, you know, people are so used to talking about close calls or near misses or first aids is kind of those more leading indicators to, to, to more serious incidents. And when you're uh, walking, when you're walking into a workplace and you see a pinch bar, a scaling bar bent. Yeah. There's, a, there's a story, there's a story there, yeah. right? You always and, try, that's a good one yeah and if we make it safe for people to talk about it then we've got a great pharmacist yeah well we're right back to the the whole if you want a reporting culture and you want people to take action you got to lead that and you got to make it safe right psychological safety is so key from a perspective of not you know i heard the word chastise earlier if you're the one that reports the lti right um, and we we almost can't help ourselves in leadership. I get asked the question as the you know the safety person here in, at Torex at corporate. I get asked like, when was the last LTI? When did we do this? When was the last? It's always the la lagging. When was that last one bad incident? Not you know did we achieve our our safety inspection and, and verification quarter with all of levels of leadership last month? Right. That's where I want to shift that conversation to. So when um, when you walk by when you walk by a 12 inch valve on a line. And there's a sledgehammer against the wall nearby. Stop and ask the question: Why is that sledgehammer there? Be, being curious is what I'm hearing, right? If you're out in the field, do it. You got to get out in the field. You got to roll those sleeves up, and you got to ask those questions. That's excellent. Um, I don't have any more questions for you, for you folks, but I, I see about four or five questions that have rolled in here from um, the the audience. So I'll I'll jump into those. Uh, in a moment, but any closing statements, any kind of burning ideas that we haven't covered yet uh, from a, you know, how can we help engineers improve that, that those designs to eliminate fatalities and serious injuries? I just get back to the hierarchy controls. Again, still train your engineers for safety in the field, but train them on how to use the hierarchy controls, help them understand critical risks, not just so they're, they're not exposed to it, but they're not exposing others through the designs they come up with. And uh, we rushed we rushed to one or two designs because of time pressures and cost pressures and all the rest of it. If we had a three by three matrix with short term, medium term, long term across the top and good, better, best down the left hand side, it would be really interesting to have all nine boxes filled in with design attributes and then management can make a better decision around which one of those um, options we're going to implement. Excellent. Well, I will jump in. Now comes the time. We've got about 10, 12 minutes left here. I'll ask some of the questions that the audience has uh, sent in. And if you're in the audience and you do have a question, feel free to type it into the Q&A uh, session, or there's like a questions box that you can fill in. So start with more of a comment. Um, this person says it's been mentioned to design out the risk. Uh, and as a whole, sessions like this need to be commonplace. So thanks for that. We're going to keep, we're going to continue to do the safety share and the topic with the thread that we're going to continue to pull on is as um, serious injuries and fatalities, of course, and preventing those in our industry, right? Um, so, so sessions like these need to be commonplace um, and revisited to ensure continuity of a safety culture for engineers and tech staff, regardless of the company. So. I think that's one of the roles that CIM, the CIM HSS is looking to play is that exact um, role. And I think there's, I've got two more episodes left planned for this year. And the last one's going to be a year end wrap up with a few uh, VHSX execs. And we'll get back to you folks on that one as well with respect to what the, the, the Health and Safety Society is up to uh, in the coming year. Um, here's a question for you folks. Um, so with the current situation and, uh, you know, the technical staff attrition, lack of experienced folks in kind of the 15 to 25 year bracket. I've noticed that there's like 
right after my cohort coming out of school, there's almost like a gap of people that haven't, uh, there, there's no engineers that are in their, in their mid to late thirties. They're all like early, late twenties, early thirties or mid forties now, right? I, I know there's those folks that cover that bracket. There's not a lot of them out there. Um, at least that I've come across. And so the knowledge share that can be, you know, those knowledge shares can be re real change. So any thoughts, gents, on on what other ways to pass on this experience and knowledge to that next generation, given that we do have a smaller amount of people enrolling in these engineering programs every year um, and uh, and less people in the field to, to begin with and less people to train them and, and mentor them. I'll just go with a couple of things. One is, you know, as operators or as management, and it's very hard to do when you've got a bunch of exercises, a bunch of scenarios you want to run, but, you know, trying to trying to just ju explain the value of getting out in the field, seeing your designs, talking to the people that utilize your design. So leadership, having that discussion with the engineers to get them in the field, to find that mentoring from the people that are doing it and get that curiosity going. I think the second one I would pass along, and if there's people on this line that are interested, you know, the universities now, we're trying to see how we implement more safety training at that level. And, and as you all know, you know, training somebody that's in university and safety is good, but it doesn't have the application in the field once they get in there. It's helping them understand the importance of safety in the university program. They need to look at that through their design. So it's not the answers to safety, but really in, you know, instilling in them the key to looking at safety in all aspects. I think those are the two things that would be valuable going forward to, to help with, with that gap. I think two two unrelated things. So in Canada, I, I think you know the country's lucky that it's got a very well defined technician, technologist, and engineering profession with with strong definitions for each. And you know when I started way back when, there weren't many engineers because we had a lot of technologists and a lot of technicians that were extremely experienced and very good at at what they did. And so that bought us time as mining engineers to then concentrate on other aspects of, of engineering. And then I think the other one is that the industry is struggling with, with reputation damage a little bit and cyclic um, metal prices, right? And so I think a lot of kids hear about starts out good and then layoffs happen and then you know we have to go on to something else. So we might as well go on to something else right off the bat. So I think the industry has, has some work to do to repair a bit of reputation damage from tailings dams failures and and all sorts of uh, other things. And, and I think one of the ways that we can stem the tide is to really promote our technicians and our technologists because they're a, a very valuable resource that not a lot of other countries have. Absolutely. I'm going to move right into the next question. So with respect to the uh, the work history you gents have, what tips would you have for a regulator who is also an engineer to share this knowledge, keeping um, keeping in mind that you know there's a fine line between uh, government sharing experiences and knowledge with mine personnel, and the requirement to remove the sense of government approval and government liability. Yeah. I'll try to jump on this one again first, but I mean, I think part of it is it's it's always hard when you're doing an investigation or inspection, you know, from a regular later point of view, or having the discussions in the in in the time when you're going through the auditing. I think actually figuring out how regulators can create training programs, doing some lessons learned, what they've learned, how things can be different would be very useful. I I sort of take this back to NI 43101 that the Securities Commission do, where they go through aspects. And they sort of say, here's what to look for. Here's some things we saw in generic situations. I think that would be valuable from a regulator's perspective. Right. I think I think there's lots of times when when they get pressure from above as well, right? And and so somebody paints them into a corner, or they paint themselves into a corner. And so I've always viewed as one of my jobs is to to get some plywood and lay it on the floor so that they can walk out of the corner without getting paint on the bottom of their shoes. And and that comes through engagement, right? And so when you when you get a really interested worker safety rep from the union side, you know, and then your own EHNS people into the room and you have an open conversation with the regulator about, you know, where's this heat coming from? 
you know, why do your bosses want these changes? Then we can start to influence the final decision before we get one back that we really don't like. Yeah, managing those relationships are key. I'll, I'll, I'll jump into the last three questions we have. I think we've got just enough time to wrap those up. I might make the last few rapid fire here, but I'll start with this one for both of you. Um, how would you suggest we facilitate and significantly improve the feedback loop from actual ongoing operations back to design and engineering? Um, and what have the operations had to change the last three years to change three years later to make the facilities safer versus design? So I think I think that's a two part question. I'll focus in on the, you know, what would you su suggest happens to facilitate improved feedback between operations and engineering design? Start with Brian on this one. I would make it a routine and 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 make it one that's uh, kind of enjoyable. So every Thursday for lunch, we're going to have a call where we talk about a fatal risk uh, in the business and and get people openly talking about that. But don't don't let it turn into an ad hoc thing. Um, make it routine. It's every Thursday at, at lunch. I love it. And then people are less nervous uh, as time goes on to open up. I'll just I'll sort of jump right on to what Brian's saying. I think you know monthly themes are something that I always liked, whether it was in the engineering field or in the in the mining field. So use those as a critical risk. And for the engineers, get down and ask the questions about that critical risk to the operators and what they're doing and you know where are they experiencing in the designs, what could they design out, but have that focus on it on a monthly basis. Yeah, this is this is going to be the last question that I think we have time for. I'll there if there are any outstanding questions, I'll personally take them and answer them myself if I can. And if not, I'll pass them on to the the guest speakers today for answers over the next week or so. Um, so if I haven't addressed your question, I apologize. We're just running tight on time. Um, but the last one I'll ask ask you gents today is, you know, how do we get the operations and maintenance input into a design done by an engineering consulting firm? who don't necessarily have direct access to those folks all the time. There seems to be those walls all the time where the operators and maintenance folks are busy working and you know the, the design folks are in the in the offices meeting with people in the office that might have flawed or in incomplete information. John? And I'll go back to, you know, we were talking in the first poll about employees and contractors and they need to be seen the same. You know the engineers whether it's internal engineers or consultants need to be seen the same and need to have that exposure to the operations the maintenance and need to be looking for it i mean part of it may be the operations not providing it part of it might be the consulting firm not looking for it but you need to have that partnership and and just like we're talking about the the employee contractor differentiation going around going away the same thing has to happen in the engineering world okay uh, I, I would I would turn up the heat a little bit as the customer on the on the consultant. If, if it's going to be an ongoing relationship, then they've got to be willing to spend some time with with the, with. Excellent. Okay. On on that note, I think we have about a minute left, Michelle. Any uh, closing remarks here before we wrap up and thank our sponsors? Thanks, Nelson. And thank you, Brian and John, and thank you to Pan American Silver for sponsoring today's webinar. I'd like to thank all of our attendees and ask that you please fill out the short survey that pops up on your screen at the close of the webinar. A link to the video recording of this webinar will be emailed to you tomorrow, along with a link to register for the next episode of the Safety Share titled Leveraging Diversity to Improve Safety on November 16th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. We hope to see you there. Thank you for joining us today. Goodbye. Thanks again, John and Brian. Thanks to the audience. And thank you again, Michelle. Take care, folks. Thanks, Allison. Thanks, Michelle.